Hey everyone, welcome to section 3.2 on Nakamoto Consensus, where we're going to be learning about how Satoshi Nakamoto used proof of work and built in incentives inside of Bitcoin in order to achieve decentralized consensus. So, our model of decentralized consensus from the last lecture had each node receiving one vote, meaning each of our nodes had a 25% chance of being picked as the temporary authority node during each round and getting to propose the next block for everyone to include. But there's a big problem with having each node having an equal chance of getting picked by this spinner. Our scheming friend Mallory could set up a node uh, with a different IP address somewhere else in the world, uh, could set up another node somewhere else in the world with a new IP address, and set up a fourth node somewhere in the world with a different IP address as well. Now you'll see that we have a pretty big problem here. Mallory and all of her fake spun up nodes have a better chance of getting picked than all of the other honest participants combined. So now if Mallory wants to execute that double spend attack, wants to censor users or avert history, she can definitely pull it off. And these fake nodes that Mallory has created are called Sybils. Sybils are just forged identities in a peer-to-peer -peer network used to subvert some system. And through the magic of things like VPNs, you can spoof your IP address, spoof where you are, hide your identity, and on the internet, in a peer-to-peer -peer network, there's no way to know if you're a Sybil node or if you're an actual new person trying to connect to the network. And one of Satoshi Nakamoto's big innovations in the Bitcoin white paper released in 2008 was that rather than giving each node one vote in the system or giving them an equal chance of getting picked, uh, which could easily be gamed by a Sybil attack, he proposed the idea of having one computation one vote or one CPU one vote, uh, or more specifically, one unit of computational power one vote. So in our spinner representation, rather than giving each node an equal chance of being picked as the next authority or leader, if we weight it based off of computational power, if Mallory, Bob, Jing, and Alice each have the same amount of computational power, suddenly it's no longer unfair. It doesn't matter how many Sybil nodes Mallory spins up, she will only have a finite amount of computational power. And so rather than needing an honest majority of nodes, which obviously could be attacked with the Sybil attack, we need an honest majority of computing power, which we hope lies distributed in the hands of many. So great, now we're selecting leaders in proportion to how much computational power they have. So if one user has one third of the total computational power, they'll have a one third chance of getting picked each round. But how do we measure computational power in a way that can't be spoofed like in the Sybil attack? And how do we make these rounds fair? Every round we have a puzzle and everyone runs their computers maxed out to their fullest to try to solve this puzzle. The better your hardware is, and the more you max that hardware out to do the most computations per second, the better chance you have of solving the puzzle. Now whoever solves the puzzle first, in this case Alice, then gets to be the temporary authority node and propose the next block for everyone to include. Now once that next block has been proposed, there is a new puzzle for everyone to solve. Everyone runs their computers to the max, doing all these computations, and Jing comes out on top, solving the puzzle first. And of course, Jing gets to be the second round authority node and propose the next block. And this process is called proof of work. The proof is the solved puzzle, which is easy to verify. And the work is all of this computational work that had to go into solving this puzzle. So by submitting this solved puzzle, you've proved that you've used a sufficient amount of computational power. But how do we actually make these computational puzzles, which are hard to solve but easy to verify? We actually only need cryptographic hash functions to create what are called hash puzzles. If you'll remember from section 1.1 where we covered hash functions, a hash function is just a function where you can have any input, let's say a picture of a dog, and you'll have a fixed size output, usually 256 bits in length. And one property of hash functions is that they're pseudo-random. So if we're hashing something for the first time, we have no idea what it's going to be. It's like rolling a dice. We don't know if the output to the hash is going to be large or small, if the first number is going to be a 1 or a 7, or if we're using hexadecimal, uh, an A or a F. So if you need a quick refresher on the pseudo-randomness of hash functions and collision resistance of hash functions, uh, please check out Carl's lecture, section 1.1. It's a great overview of how hash functions work. Uh, but back to proof of work. From last lecture, the way that we compute a block hash is we hash all of the transactions of a block together with the previous block hash, 
which in this case is the zero hash because this is the first block. And that gave us our chain of blocks. But what we're going to add is a third input, which we're going to call a nonce, which is really just this nonsense number. So we'll run some operations on our computer to compute this hash, and we'll get the output, which is 3827. Uh, this is the block hash. Now what we'll see, though, is if we increment the nonce and we recompute the block hash, it's like rolling a die. We have no idea if this is going to be a larger block hash or a smaller block hash. Uh, we're generating a new pseudo-random number. And so now we get this new hash, 30eb. And if we increment the nonce again to be 2 uh, and recompute the block hash, we're basically rolling the dice again, and we'll get this new block hash, 90d84. So you'll see that every time we increment the nonce and we recalculate this hash, we're getting this random 256-bit block hash afterwards. So if we think of a coin flip, and we say heads is 0 and tails is 1, we can think of this process of incrementing the nonce and recomputing this random 256-bit output as if we're flipping this quarter 256 times, and every time we get heads, we write a 0, and every time we get tails, we write a 1. Now remember that every time we compute a hash, it requires some computational power. It would probably take a lot of hashes for you to, say, flip a certain number of heads in a row at the very start. What if I said that the first 30 of your 256 coin flips have to be heads? This is how we make a difficult puzzle that's easy to verify, but hard to compute. In practice, this is the equivalent of saying, hey, your block hash has to be less than some target number. So for example, this could be your target number. Now this might look very intimidating, but all it is is saying, because each hex number is 4 bits, and we need 6 hex zeros in a row, it's the equivalent of saying, alright, we're flipping a coin 256 times, the first 6 times 4, so 24 coin flips, have to be heads. And the average number of hashes that's required to find 24 head flips in a row is 16.8 million hashes. Now that's a big number, but you know computers nowadays are super fast, so what if that's too easy? Well, one of the nice things about these hash puzzles is that it's very easy to adjust the difficulty of them. All we have to do is take this F and make it a little smaller, say turn it into a zero, and now we have a smaller target. So we require the block hash to have seven leading hex zeros, which is the equivalent of 28 head flips in a row. So the average number of random hashes that you'll need to compute until you find a block hash that has 28 leading zero bits is around 268 million. So if we find that that's too hard of a puzzle and it's taking too long for people to solve it, we can just make the target larger. So let's take these two zeros and turn them into Fs. So now we only need five leading hex zeros, so the equivalent of 20 head flips in a row. Now this will only take an average of 1 million random hashes until you find a block hash that has 20 leading zero bits. So here we have a representation of our network. We have Bob, Mallory, and Alice all competing to solve the next hash puzzle and propose the next block. And we call this process of expending all this computing power to compute all these hashes and solve this proof of work mining. And this term comes from an analogy between doing all of this computational work in order to get lucky and propose the next block, and doing the actual physical work of, say, swinging a pickaxe at a rock over and over again until you get lucky and might find gold. And in our example here, Alice has 50% of the mining hash rate, Bob has 25%, and Mallory has 25% meaning Alice is computing as many hashes per second as Bob and Mallory combined. So we see our computers doing lots of computations, but you know, what exactly is happening behind the scenes? Well, at the start of the network, everyone has agreed that there is no previous block, so the previous block header that they are mining on top of is just the zero hash. And the problem that everyone's computers are trying to solve right now is what nonce can you hash together with the transactions of the first block and the previous block hash in order to get a small block hash that has a certain number of leading zeros. So Alice, who's one of the miners, will first try a nonce of zero. Her computer will compute that hash and will get 782744. Uh, is the block header hash less than the target? Definitely not. There's not enough leading zeros. The block hash is too large. So Alice's mining software will increment the nonce to be 1, 
We'll recompute that hash and we'll get a new hash, 67E6. And the software will check again, is this block header hash less than the target? And of course it's not, there's not enough leading zeros. And hopefully you get a feel for what's happening. She's gonna increment the nonce again, compute the hash, and eventually Alice will come across a nonce. In this case, it's 21,078,235 that will get her a hash that is finally less than the target. So now that Alice has solved this hash puzzle, Alice will take her block with all her transactions and will add this block hash, uh, which satisfies the properties of being less than the target, and will throw it in a packet along with the winning nonce. And now Alice will start mining on a new second block. Instead of a previous block header hash of this zero hash, she'll update it to the block header hash that she has just found. So she'll add this block to her blockchain and she'll start mining to solve the hash puzzle for the second block. She'll send her block to all of her peers and Mallory will receive the block. She'll check that the hash of that block's transactions together with the zero hash and the nonce that Alice provided does check out to having enough leading zeros. And now Mallory will update her previous block header hash to be this block hash of Alice's block. And Mallory too will start trying to solve the hash puzzle for a second block. Now even though Jing is not mining, Jing is not competing in this hash puzzle competition, she can also very easily verify that Alice's block took a lot of work to do because she can just compute that one hash together with the nonce that Alice provided to see that Alice's block hash checks out and must have taken many, many hash computations in order to find this valid block hash. And lastly, Bob will receive the block, will verify it as well, and will start mining a second block. And this is great. Everyone is in consensus on the very first block. And Alice, Mallory, and Bob are all trying to mine a second block that points to Alice's first block. So now all of our miners will be computing hashes, computing hashes, trying to find this second block for some time. And Mallory will be our lucky winner, coming out on top, finding out that when she combines the transactions of a second block together with the previous block hash, which is the block hash of Alice's first block, and a nonce of 72,558,827, she gets a block hash with a bunch of leading zeros that turns out is less than the target. So now that Mallory has found a solution to this hash puzzle, she will add her block hash to this block of all of these transactions and she will throw it into a packet. And of course, Mallory will add this second block to her blockchain and she'll update her previous hash from Alice's block hash to the block hash of this second block that she's just found. And Mallory will go ahead and will propagate that message to everyone and everyone will start mining on this new second block because it's the longest chain. And everyone is in consensus on the first block Everyone's in consensus about the second block, and everyone is now competing to solve the hash puzzle for a third block that points to Mallory's second block. Now let me interrupt this simulation real quick just to make a note of the difference between this system and the system we covered in the last lecture. Now in our theoretical protocol from last lecture, we could just say have a round every 10 minutes, uh, so every 600 seconds we just spin that spinner and pick someone. But with proof of work, we don't know how long it will take someone to find the solution to a hash puzzle. We can approximate it by making the hash puzzle more difficult or less difficult depending on the average times that you're getting, but you don't know exactly how long it's gonna be. For example, if I had a six-sided die and I roll it once a second, I could say that on average, it'll take me around six seconds in order to roll a six. Of course, I could get unlucky, it could take me 20 seconds, or I could get lucky and get it on the first try, and it would take just one second. So let's run through one situation that might occur as a result of this. Right now, everyone is trying to solve the proof of work for the third block, and Alice gets lucky and finds a valid block hash. She'll add this third block to her chain, and she'll start mining on top of that block. And she'll add it to a packet and start to propagate it to the network. But Bob happens to get lucky at the very same time. Finding a valid block hash for his own third block which he then adds to his blockchain and starts mining on top of. So Bob will also try to propagate his block to all of his peers. And it looks like Mallory receives Alice's block first, so she will verify it, she will add it to her blockchain, and she will start mining on top of Alice's block. Now Jing receives Bob's block first, and Jing will verify that that block hash is valid, and will add it to her blockchain. And we'll see that Alice and Mallory have a different history than Bob and Jing. And no one was malicious in this case. 
Bob just happened to find a block before he received Alice's block. And now we've got Mallory and Alice mining on top of Alice's block and Bob mining on top of his own block. So everyone will be computing hashes for some time now and Alice gets lucky and finds a valid block hash for a fourth block. Now Alice will propagate that block to everyone and Mallory will verify it and will add it to her blockchain. And Jing will see this block and verify that the block hash is valid. And Jing's Bitcoin node will take a look at all of the blocks that she knows about. And because in Bitcoin, the longest chain is always considered the correct chain, Jing will discard Bob's block and will add both of Alice's blocks. And when Bob receives Alice's block, he will look at these two options and notice that Alice's chain is longer than his chain. And Bob's software will automatically pick the longest chain. In Bitcoin, the fork choice rule which is how you choose between these two different paths, is to always pick the longest fork. So now everyone is back in consensus. So even though we temporarily fell out of consensus, eventually everyone will agree on history. And as long as a majority of people are acting honestly, these disagreements of history will become less and less frequent as they fall further and further back in time. So now everything's good and everyone has consensus of what the four blocks in everyone's chains are. Now, even though they fell out of consensus briefly, as time goes on, people will start to agree on what the longest chain is. And when we're talking more than five or six blocks back in history, it becomes more and more likely that everyone agrees on those blocks. But there is one piece of the Bitcoin protocol that we haven't touched on yet. Think of all of our miners computing billions and billions of hashes. They had to spend a lot of money on this hardware that can compute hashes really fast. And all of this computational work costs a lot of money to pay for the electricity to keep these computers going and to keep them cool. So why would they fork over all of their hard-earned cash to just compute hashes on this network? Well, in every block, there's a special transaction that mints money to whoever the miner chooses. Think of it like a blank check to whoever mines that block. Now this special transaction is called a block reward. And it's the main reason why people spend millions and millions of dollars on hardware and electricity trying to solve proofs of work on Bitcoin. But in Bitcoin, the block rewards aren't always a constant amount. Around every four years, the amount of Bitcoin in the block reward gets cut in half, which is how the system ensures that there's a capped supply of Bitcoin. Now, going back to our mining analogy, you can think of this block reward having as it getting harder and harder to find gold until you've found it all. So we have this awesome block reward that's incentivizing our miners, but, but what incentivizes our miners to include any transactions at all other than this block reward? Well, let's say we have this transaction from Jing sending $100 to Bob, Jing could instead just send Bob $99 and will give that extra dollar to whichever miner includes that transaction in their block. Now this is called a transaction fee. Most miners will just fill their block up with the transactions that pay the most fees. And this is partly what helps Bitcoin maintain this censorship resistant property. Even if most miners decide that they don't want to include any transactions to or from some person that they don't like, all it takes is one miner to defect and include those transactions and profit off of those fees. So in conclusion, Bitcoin is really an awesome protocol. You have all these miners competing with their computational power to mine the next block in order to earn the block reward and transaction fees in the form of Bitcoin, the built-in currency for the system. So you get this really awesome property where the more computational power that miners are using, the more expensive it will be to censor or revert history on the network. And having this censorship and reversion resistant system helps give Bitcoin economic value. And because this Bitcoin has value, miners are willing to spend tons of money in order to get rewarded in Bitcoin with the block reward and transaction fees. So in the next section, we're going to be covering a data structure that is used in the Bitcoin protocol called the Merkle tree. Merkle trees are an awesome cryptographic primitive that is not only useful in protocols like Bitcoin and Ethereum, but is also a fundamental part of how things like Plasma work. I'll see you there.